Welcome to Let the Quran Speak. I'm Aisha, your host. How do scientists explore and understand the theory of biological evolution and religion? Does it align with these perspectives or is it different? Let's explore this topic further through our series on biological evolution with Dr. Shabir Ali. Welcome to the show, Dr. Shabir. Pleasure to be on. So we're talking about scientists' perspectives today about uh, biological evolution. So uh, I know you've reviewed two particular scientists' our perspectives on this. So what is their view on biological evolution and religion? Can they coexist? Uh, yes. Uh, the, the first of these is um, uh, Stephen Jay Gould. He's mm -hmm. uh, a well-known evolutionist, uh, well-known for his uh, theory of punctuated uh, equilibrium, uh, which uh, is different from what most uh, evolutionists uh, uh, have held. Most evolutionists have the idea of a gradual uh, change, a gradual mm -hmm. progress and development over time. Uh, but uh, according to Stephen Jay Gould, uh, there, uh, there, uh, there, there would be some gradual evolution over time, and, and then that gradualness is somehow punctuated. There's a sudden stop to the gradualness, uh, and uh, there, there is a sudden jump in the evolution due to certain environmental and other factors and genetic mutations and so on. Uh, so, so, so that's different, and he's well known for this, um, but he's also well known as, uh, as an evolutionist, uh, one who subscribes to the theory. So it's interesting to find him um, allowing uh, for uh, the theory of evolution to coexist with uh, a, a belief uh, in religion in, in the same person. And um, uh, that comes as a surprise to many people because many people would think that there is an inherent clash between religion and science and you have to embrace one or the other. And yeah, and I'm surprised yeah. to hear that a scientist would actually say that because I, I always thought a scientist's perspective is solely science-based and there's no room for religion. Uh, yes, of course as a scientist, uh, when he does science, uh, he will not invoke God, he will not bring God into the picture or anything about religious beliefs. Uh, he's just uh, going to focus on what is observable and uh, the conclusions from the observable uh, uh, data. Mm -hmm. Now, not only is this his opinion, which you know many people can say some opinion off the cuff, but he's actually written a whole book about this, which okay. I'd like to introduce to our uh, readership, mm -hmm. to our viewership. Uh, the book is uh, entitled Rocks of Ages, uh, Science and Religion in the Fullness of Life. And uh, uh, the, in, in this book, he argues that science and religion uh, should be treated as uh, two overlapping uh, to, to non-overlapping mm -hmm. uh, magisteria. The term magisteria is the plural of magisterium, which is a word known in the Catholic tradition uh, to depict the Catholic Church as the teaching authority. So according to uh, Stephen uh, Jay Gould, uh, science on the one hand and religion on the other hand are, are two. Uh, different magisteria. They both teach us something mm -hmm. and uh, they are non-overlapping. Each has its own predefined area of specialization and we should respect both for what they do. So how does he come to this conclusion? What are some of the main arguments that he makes? Well, as a scientist, he recognizes that science cannot tell us about purpose and, uh, and values. Uh, science cannot teach us morality, but religion does. Uh, science can tell us about the successful replication of bugs and bacteria, but uh, science cannot decide whether human beings are more precious than bugs and, and bacteria. Mm -hmm. So this is a question of value, um, and that comes from religion. It's religion that teaches us that human beings are created in the image of God, and, and that therefore the human beings are precious, and they have a close and a special relationship uh, with God and a position in God's uh, purposeful plan. Uh, m moreover, science cannot t tell you about uh, whether it is right to do something or wrong to do something. Scientists now are in the position uh, to tinker with uh, genomes. They can take mm -hmm. a gene from one uh, organism and implant it into another organism. But is it right to do so? So scientists have that skill, but, but how can they decide whether you know, a certain uh, level of genetic tinkering or any sort of interference with nature is right or wrong, or any action for that matter? Does he bring this up in his book? Yes, in okay. fact, he mentions these as the validation uh, for uh, including religion as one of the uh, teaching mm -hmm. uh, magisteria that he talks about. So uh, he, he, he coined an acronym for, for that NOMA, mm -hmm. uh, interesting acronym. Uh, non-overlapping 
magisteria, science and religion. So that, that's his take on that. And what about, I know you have another book hidden, uh, Michael <laughs> yes, Bruce, I've, I've, let's pull it out. <laughs> I have these books hidden, you know, to pull out in, at the uh, opportune moment. Exactly. So the other one is by Michael Roos, um, entitled Can a Darwinian Be a Christian? Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he subtitles it, The Relationship Between Science and a Religion. Now this is a very detailed book and uh, very well argued, very thoughtfully put together, a, a detailed treatment of the challenges uh, that faces anyone who tries to uh, reach some kind of syncretism between uh, science on the one hand and Christianity on the, on the other hand. Uh, th there are, to begin with, uh, certain um, obvious um, difficulties that have, are faced before one gets into the depths of science, like difficulties uh, regarding the coherence of the Trinity and, uh, and, and some core Christian ideas. Uh, and, and even before uh, the development of modern science, people had already uh, started to raise objections to um, uh, Christian belief in particular, and not only regarding the Trinity and, and other such core concepts, mm -hmm. but even more so uh, the, the, the idea of religion as a whole. People have said maybe that uh, um, religion was invented because people did not understand how the world works. So mm -hmm. even with a rudimentary, um, a level of uh, scientific knowledge, people had already raised these objections. Now the objections have be become compounded with the development of modern science because it would seem that modern science explains uh, many of the things for which people had invoked God. And, and people continue to invoke God if they, something is not easy to explain from a naturalistic or scientific point of view. Somebody will say, well, God must have done it. Mm -hmm. So this uh, approach is referred to as the God of the gaps principle. When you, when, you can, when, when you have a gap in a natural explanation, you say, okay, God must be the one mm -hmm. who did something that, that explains that gap. But uh, the uh, retort from scientists uh, to that sort of approach is that eventually science will find out uh, what, that like gap is. what that gap is, mm -hmm. and, 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 and there won't be a gap anymore and God would be squeezed out of, of, the, of the gaps which were there. And so uh, he, he confronts many of these difficulties, deals with them, and uh, there is, from a, a religious point of view, a reply to this and that we can say that God is responsible uh, for the entire process. God is in, uh, responsible for um, the natural laws behind which uh, or, or which form the basis of evolutionary growth and, and development and so mm -hmm. on. So we don't need the God of the gaps um, uh, approach. Uh, but, but it's very interesting to read his book and see uh, the, the many difficulties that present themselves uh, to anyone who tries to have both positions, both believing in the theory of evolution and at the same time believing in God, uh, but his conclusion is uh, simply put uh, uh, that uh, it is possible for one to have both th despite these challenges. So as we look at you know both of these books and the larger context of our series of biological evolution and, and the support and, uh, and the idea of a creative evolution, how do we, how do we want to um, I guess wrap this up for our viewers? Well I want to say that uh, the, the idea of creative evolution, the idea that God creates through the process of evolution, mm -hmm. Uh, is uh, one that is uh, receiving growing acceptance. Uh, acceptance uh, from, as we can see now, the part of many scientists, uh, acceptance from the part uh, of many uh, adherents of religion as well. And perhaps in another episode, we will look at uh, some Muslim approaches uh, to uh, the theory of evolution, some who have tried to deny the theory altogether, but some others who have uh, more lately tried to uh, find harmony between uh, the theory of evolution and our belief that God created the universe. And that harmony is best stated by saying that it is through that process that scientists are describing under the title of evolution that God actually created uh, the, and, and continues to create and develop and cause to evolve uh, the, the universe with us in it and, and us along with it. And, and in that case, we would not be speaking about uh, a blind process of evolution, but mm -hmm. we would be speaking about a guided evolution, one that is guided by and controlled uh, by God as much as God deems it necessary for his involvement. A beautiful wrap-up as always. Thank you very much, Dr. You're Shere. welcome. If you want more of Let the Quran Speak, you can watch previous episodes or new ones by subscribing to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Quran Speaks. 
Stay updated by liking us on Facebook and following us on Twitter at Quran underscore speaks. And when you're on the go, listen to our podcast at QuranSpeaks.com.